presentation. We'll be uh, uploading a copy of this presentation to SlideShare tomorrow morning. <clears throat> All participants will be sent a follow-up email that includes a link that will allow you to download a copy. By default, GoToWebinar mutes all participants except a speaker, which is a good thing because it reduces the chance of background noise affecting the presentation. We're going to hold questions until the end. There's a button on the GoToWebinar panel that will allow you to type your questions in. Kelly, who's the webinar's organizer, will bundle them up and we'll discuss them at the end. We want to be respectful of your time. We know that many of you will have meetings right after this one, so we've timed the presentation to allow Q&A at the end. Before in danger of running over, I'll respond to the remaining questions by email. Our intent is to have these RDX Insights presentations monthly. Next month's presentation will be on business intelligence. We'll begin the presentation with a general overview, discuss how BI fits into your enterprise, we'll review some of the best practices, and then dig a little more deeply into specific benefits of Microsoft's business intelligence offering. We'll conclude the presentation with a demo of the Microsoft BI product suite. The demo will be provided by Jeremy B.I. Fry, who has been working with business intelligence for over a decade. I also distribute a monthly newsletter that you might be interested in. It covers interesting technical topics that we think would benefit our customers both personally and professionally. This month's newsletter includes articles on business intelligence best practices, optimizing Oracle licensing, and what happens after a data breach, working with cybercrime investigators. The latest issue also has links to video presentations on NoSQL architectures and Microsoft's Azure Advisor. It's an advisor provided by Microsoft that evaluates your environment and helps you save money. Each newsletter also has a helpful hint on how to maximize your relationship with RDX. If you'd like to be added to the distribution list, let me know. I'll display my email on the last slide of this presentation. You can always add me as your LinkedIn buddy. I write articles and slideshare presentations on a lot of different wide-ranging technical topics. So let's get started with today's presentation. There's lots of cloud options we can choose from. You have your choice of IAS and DBPAS architectures. Once you decide upon the architecture, there are many different vendor offerings available. Here's a couple of quick DBPAS examples. We'll learn the difference between IAS and DBPAS in a couple of minutes. MongoDB released a cloud database service in 2016. Amazon uh, has Aurora, its own version of a MySQL compatible database. The keyword there is compatible. We'll talk about the varying degrees of on-premises versus cloud DBPAS compatibility in a few slides. Amazon RDS offers cloud database services for PostgreSQL, Oracle MySQL, MariahDB, Oracle DB and SQL Server. DynamoDB is Amazon's NoSQL database. IBM's Cloud, that product's based on CouchDB. It's a document style NoSQL database, a competitor of MongoDB. Azure SQL database, as most of us know, is a SQL Server like database in the cloud. Google also offers Cloud SQL, which is another MySQL implementation. Here's what RDX has learned over the last few years supporting these cloud database management systems. They are increasing in popularity. As they do, the requests for our services are also increasing. We'll discuss the different cloud options you have to choose from. Depending on your selected cloud architecture, that environment can be dramatically different from your on-premises systems. Because they can be so radically different, they will change the way you support them. The vendor offerings themselves differ greatly in many areas. In addition, we'll also learn that some databases are more at home in the cloud than others. The challenge is that all these offerings provide different computing architectures. Cloud compute, memory, disk storage mechanisms. We'll get into some, we'll get into some of these a little more deeply throughout the course of this presentation. Not only are, are cloud DB architectures different, from on-premises systems. Depending on what offerings you're comparing, they could be dramatically different from each other. From provisioning or building the system to monitoring the administration of mature systems, the changes can be extensive. We'll be doing a deep dive into some of these challenges in upcoming slides. 
In our last slide, we were really focusing on the technological differences. Here's a laundry list of some of the business process changes that will occur when you move a database up onto the cloud. We've covered some of these discussion points in previous presentations, but we really need to restate them because one of the critical evaluation criteria we're going to use to compare DBP AAS to IAS, as well as the different vendor offerings, is how big of an impact will that cloud architecture have on the way my shop provides support. Then we need to identify what level of change we're comfortable with. Let's continue our discussion by learning more about the two primary cloud architectures, Infrastructure as a Service, IAAS, and Platform as a Service, PAAS. Since we're talking about database management systems, Let's use the term database platform as a service to define that architecture. We all have experience with on-premises systems. We have to build the server rooms, provide heating, cooling, redundant connectivity and power. We're required to purchase, install, and administer all the mechanisms to provide the safest environment we can afford for our systems. We're then required to buy the server hardware, install and maintain it. When it breaks or we want to increase horsepower, we have to crack the chassis and work on the server components. We have CPU, memory, disk, whatever we need. When we perform these activities, we either have to take an outage or make plans to shift the system and workloads to another server to ensure availability. We also buy and administer the OS and DB software we need to run our database-driven applications. In addition, we need to evaluate, buy, and install, and support all the other products we need for that server monitoring, security, auditing, third-party reporting products. Look at the two stars excuse me, in the lower left of our screen. <coughs> we have to buy and support everything, both hardware and software. Let's move on to the cloud. Most IAS and DBPAS offerings are multi-tenant, which means we're sharing the vendor's compute and storage architectures with other customers. In addition, depending on the architecture and vendor chosen, the system will vary in degrees of scalability, elasticity, and administrative self-service. The architecture that is the closest to on-premises is infrastructure as a service. That's the architecture defined in the middle bottom of the slide. With infrastructure as a service, the vendor provides the compute and storage infrastructure components and may offer some level of system maintenance activities. You have direct access to the server and storage, much like an on-premises system, but you're able to leverage a higher level uh, degree of elasticity and scalability. Think of it as a server, more often than not, a virtual server in the cloud. You don't have to build your server support environment that provides air, light, multiple power providers, UPS systems, generators, redundant connections to the internet. All that's provided by the vendor but you'll continue to maintain ownership of your software stack's administration, including the operating system and the database. You install and administer your software of choice on that platform. It's important to note that depending on the IAS provider and the offering you've chosen, customers are able to take advantage of some of the vendor's features to reduce the time to support the environment. Microsoft Azure, for example, provides you with builds, which you can use to get a jump start on provisioning a new DB environment. But you then need to tailor that generic build to meet your needs. There's dozens and dozens of different IES providers. For example, RDX, we use Expedient. It's a nationally known IES vendor. They get external power from multiple utilities, have banks of UPS systems, twin diesel generators, redundant air conditioners, advanced fire suppression, and the list goes on and on. We're set up for geographic server redundancy. If Pittsburgh goes out, our workloads can be transferred to the designated failover data center. So now we know that IAS is pretty much a server in the cloud. Let's move on to PAAS, or in our case, talking about databases, DBPAAS, Database Platform as a Service. DBPAS vendors provide all the server environmental benefits that their IAS counterparts do. But database platform as a service, it significantly raises provider control over the customer's environment. D 
DBPAS providers assume ownership of the operating system and the database software as well as the hardware in the server environment. DBPAS customers perform little to no operating system and database software administration. The DBPAS vendors also make modifications to their database software primarily for two reasons. One is to ensure their product will work in this, a shared environment and two, to leverage the benefits that the cloud and their architecture inherently provides. Geographic data redundancy would be a good example. It allows customers to leverage the cloud to very easily create DR and HA systems. It's important to note that as we discuss IAS and DBPAS, there can be a lot of variations in the vendor offerings. Let's take a look at this comparison. IAS allows you to maintain tighter administrative control over your environment. You can more easily leverage your favorite internal third-party products on IAS systems than you can with DBPAS. Remember, IAS is just a server in the cloud. Many of the third-party tools, monitoring security, application development, auditing, they can be challenging to integrate into a DBPAS architecture because of the modifications that the vendors have made to their systems. All the DBPAS vendors do provide monitoring tools. Some vendors like Amazon will charge you extra if you want a more robust monitoring solution than what's provided by their base package. In general, their monitoring tools aren't as robust as the on-premises counterparts. If your DBPAS provider determines that its own internal underlying software, OS, or database needs a critical availability, security, or performance patch, you may not have a choice on its implementation. If that patch requires an outage, you will need to schedule that outage most often before a certain date. DBPAS offerings allow you to more easily configure complex architectures, high availability, disaster recovery, all the DBPAS providers, all the major ones, offer geo data redundancy. You also need to remember that since you're renting the DB and OS software, when that relationship with that DBPAS provider is over, you don't own anything. Migrating to a DBPAS environment does reduce the amount of time a DBA spends administering the database environment. But it doesn't reduce that administrative time to zero. You will experience the most significant time savings in OS administration and hardware support. DBAs do spend time installing, patching, and upgrading the DBMS software, as well as setting up and monitoring maintenance and backup utilities. Many of these administrative tasks can be provided by the DBPAS vendor, depending on the vendor and the offering chosen. But the majority of our time as DBAs is spent working within the database systems themselves. You know, we build schemas, we grant security, assist developers with SQL and procedural program tuning, we provide advice and force business logic using database features, we tune the database, debug issues, DBAPAS vendors, in general, don't provide those services as part of their base package. It's important to remember that although the vendor may provide the mechanisms and processes to perform administrative activities, this doesn't reduce your support responsibilities for them to zero. Personnel may need to configure how they are to be performed when they're scheduled. All the vendors provide patching, maintenance utilities, backup processes, but it's up to the customer to configure and schedule them, as well as monitor their execution. Because the environment is different than on-premises systems, you'll have to update your change management processes and documentation. How long that takes and the number of texts you'll have to dedicate to that project depends upon, once again, the architecture you choose and how stringent your change management processes and documentation requirements are because DBPAS is administered much more differently than on-premises, it's going to have a greater impact on your documentation in IAS, which is just really a server in the cloud. 
the amount of documentation, documentation changes required will depend upon the breadth and depth of documentation your particular organization requires as a best practice. Once again, a greater impact for DBPAS. You'll need to identify all the build, administration, monitoring, and access tools that your shop uses to interact with your on-premises systems. All shops usually have a couple of must-have tools that are frequently used. The popularity of the cloud is certainly driving most product vendors to make sure their software offerings work with the cloud systems, but you're going to need to double check. Our recommendation is to create a list and verify that those tools will continue to work with the cloud versions of the database. They'll most likely work with IAS, but for DBPAS, you'll need to perform the due diligence to determine if they can integrate or you'll need to identify the level of effort to integrate them. We've had several customers, especially those that use MySQL, find that the different cloud offerings don't support the exact same features or even the SQL language nuances as their on-premises counterparts. What we found was that the different flavors, Oracle MySQL versus Amazon Aurora MySQL, didn't work the same way for some features or the features weren't available. You need to make sure that you align the features between on-premises and cloud implementations if you're going to utilize the cloud to separate your test and prod environments. Microsoft SQL Server on Amazon RDS. So we're discussing now Amazon's DBPAS offering. It doesn't support Polybase, Stretch Database, backing up to blob storage, importing data into the MSDB database. You can't rename a database if it's used in an Amazon mirroring deployment, and it doesn't allow you to increase storage on a SQL Server database. If you need to increase the storage of a SQL Server DB instance, you back it up, create a new DB instance with the increased storage, and then restore the databases into a new DB instance. In addition, the product doesn't support SSIS, SSAS, or SSRS. It doesn't have SQL Server level security roles for sysadmin, server admin, security admin, DB creator, and bulk admin. It also doesn't support database mail, maintenance plans, distributed queries, log shipping, change data capture, SQL Server audit, or bulk insert. <coughs> Excuse me. How about the Azure SQL database versus SQL Server on-premises? Two DB products, both SQL Server, offered by the same vendor, Microsoft. Microsoft Azure DBPS offering doesn't support attaching a database, backup and restore statements, change data capture, database mail, mirroring, snapshots, extended store procedures, file streams, link servers, log shipping, resource governor, the profiler, SSIS, AS, and RS. Now, instead of mirroring and log shipping, it does provide active geodata replication, which can be a better alternative for many customers. It's just different. I'm not stating that these environments aren't as effective as on-premises. They just have different features, and we need to be aware of those different features. Now, we know that this feature mismatch is a pretty big deal for consumers. We also know that for the foreseeable future, that cloud and on-premises systems will coexist with each other. The two heavyweight relational contenders, Oracle and Microsoft, both understand how important it is for customers, especially those that have a lot of on-premises systems, to be able to make a seamless transition to cloud architectures. Both vendor strategies are hybrid clouds, which has the goal of providing 100% seamless administration for DBAs and 100% co-transportability for developers. Their strategy is to allow administrators to use the same tools on both systems and provide an exact feature match between cloud and on-premises systems. Oracle describes it as a single pane of glass. Microsoft has the same strategy, but neither vendor is totally there. Microsoft offers a stretch database that spans both on-premises and cloud. 
my opinion is that the winner of cloud versus on-premises, that database war will not be on-premises or the cloud. It's going to be this hybrid solution, which provides shops with the option of seamlessly choosing between cloud and on-premises implementations. Customers will want a total cloud solution, have the option of adding Amazon as an alternative, but they're going to be locked into a total cloud-based solution. And that's not a bad alternative if that's your intended strategy. Or with Microsoft's hybrid environments, they'll become the architecture of choice for customers who are committed to Oracle's and Microsoft's product offerings. They'll also become attractive alternatives for those shops who prefer the freedom to choose between cloud and on-premises database implementations. Before we take a look at some of these competing IAS and DBPS offerings, let's spend a few minutes on the creation of a cloud architecture strategy. What's your experience level? If your shop is, if you're just starting out, you may want to test the waters using infrastructure as a service and then move into DBPAS. IAS is just much closer to your on-premises in terms of support and product uh, compatibility. If you prefer to rent your OS and DB software, DBPAS is a better choice. You just need to remember that you won't own anything when your relationship with that vendor is over. How many changes are you comfortable making to your application software and database? How about to your internal procedures? Change management, security. You'll need to allocate human capital, create project plans, and allocate funding to those conversions. The impact of those changes will be much higher on DBPAS than if you chose IAS. Do you want to reduce your human labor costs to support the OS? We learned in a previous slide that DBPAS does reduce the amount of DBA support hours that dramatically, but it does. But most of those savings will be attributed to the OS. You also need to investigate your shop's software products that interact with your DB systems. We talked about monitoring, security, application development. If you're going to use DBPAS, you'll need to verify that they'll continue to work or find viable replacements. The same thing goes for your in-house and COTS applications. We learned that not all the features that are available in on-premises databases are provided by their DBPAS counterparts. You'll need to identify the features not available, distribute them to your vendors and internal developers to find out if their applications will work with a DBPAS system. If they rely heavily on a particular feature to provide critical application functionality, they, mean they may need to rewrite that, or that database or databases could be moved to an IAS architecture, or they could remain on premises. Are your systems heavily audited? IAS provides greater visibility and ease of access to the system than DBPAS. We also need to select databases to be migrated to our architecture of choice, whatever we choose, DBPAS or IAS. Some databases work better on the cloud than others. One of the challenges that we need to evaluate, how much data do you want to transfer back and forth in that cloud architecture? How much data and how long does it take to send or receive it? In addition, we'll need to determine if our vendor offering charges us for those transfers and how much. Does the database interact with other systems? As DBAs, we all know that a very popular feature in any database management system, no matter which one you use, is using its inherent leaking capability to access data in other database systems. You can use a single SQL statement to access one database and then use the DB links, the database links, to join that information to the, to the data residing in other databases. Will those other databases be on-premises or are you going to move those into the cloud? Does it generate a lot of output? Do you use that database data to refresh other systems? Does it generate large reports or flat files? and other data streams that are used as input to other apps. What features does that database use? We're going to need to verify that all the features utilized in that database 
are available if we choose DBPAS. We'll also need to analyze all the software that interacts with that database. Does the database utilize any highly available features? How critical is it? What are its backup requirements? How many copies, uh, uh, backup copies do you need to retain? We may get charged for both disk storage as well as the IOPS to create those backups. How big is it? How will we initially seed our database? Some of the vendors will send you a disk storage suitcase, that's the way I'll describe it. You copy your database on that device and then send it back to them. That way you won't have to send your entire database over the internet for its initial seeding. Security. Is the database governed by internal, industry-specific, or governmental regulations? We learned that DBPAS environments don't have the same level of visibility as IAS or on-premises. What we need to remember is that no database is an island. As I said, they take feeds from flat files and other database apps, and they produce output that's ingested by other apps and end users. Getting a lot of data into and out of the cloud can be challenging if you have tight time constraints or you're pushing a lot of data, large data volumes, back and forth. Securing a cloud DBMS isn't that much different than on-premises. We may use different mechanisms and commands, but the same best practices apply. But we'll also need to secure data transfers to and from that cloud environment. We also need to secure work files, backup files, reports, data streams sent to other applications. They'll all need to be secured. All the input and output, as well as the communication pipes themselves. Evaluating initial and ongoing costs is critical. You aren't going to be purchasing your environment, you're going to be renting it. Those rental fees can vary pretty dramatically. You can search the web and you'll find numerous cases of shops that didn't do their due diligence and created cloud architectures, especially on Amazon, and were surprised at the charges they were incurring. Each offering has different ways of charging the customer. We need to understand them. There are numerous articles that provide best practices on what you can do to reduce ongoing costs. Let's take a look at a few of these cost calculators. Most vendors offer these calculators. They help you estimate initial setup and ongoing support costs. Here's three examples from Amazon, Oracle, and Microsoft. Amazon is the most robust, but it's also the most complicated. On the left side of that Amazon provisioning pane, it lists all the different configuration wizards. There's about 120 of them. The vendors provide calculators for both IAS and DBPAS architectures. For the sake of time, let's take a, a deeper dive just into Microsoft Azure for an example. So when you're talking about SQL Azure, it uses the concept of database transaction units. They call it DTUs. They use DTUs to measure resource consumption. It's a blending of CPU, memory, data I.O., and transaction log I.O. A DTU is for a single Azure database, while EDTUs, that's the same unit of measure, only for an elastic database pool, which can consist of many databases. Since we don't have a lot of experience combining these resource consumption measurements, I think the only way that we'll truly estimate those costs is to run a representative workload on that DBPAS architecture. The Azure SQL database is purchased and provisioned using standard, premium, and premium RS tiers. You get so many DTUs allocated to your single SQL database, or so many EDTUs allocated to your elastic pool. Not only do these tiers govern DTUs and EDTUs, they also provide limits on the maximum database size, max concurrent logins, and max concurrent sessions. Once you hit that limit, Azure is going to begin reducing your resource usage, either by causing some of the work in the system to queue, possibly fail. I'm only using Azure as an example. Amazon and Oracle are also complex. There's a lot of different architectures, tiers, and options you can choose from. 
the vendor architecture tier you select as well as how you configure them, it's going to impact your monthly fees. Of course, our recommendation is going to be to do the background work to understand them, choose the setting as the best fit for the environment you want to build, then monitor your fees and adjust as necessary. Let's continue our focus on these cloud architectures by looking at three of the heavyweight contenders. For shops that are contemplating public cloud DBMS implementations, there's dozens of architectures and vendor offerings available. Performing a feature-by-feature -feature comparison of the vendors is far beyond the scope of this presentation. There's a myriad of individual evaluation criteria that need to be identified, weighted, ranked, compared, and analyzed. Because the importance of choosing the most appropriate cloud architecture and DBMS provider, RDX provides cloud DBMS advisory services, which includes assisting our customers with cloud vendor analysis selection, as well as migration to the cloud. We could spend hours analyzing these different providers. Let's focus on three vendors that provide both IAS and DBPAS offerings. Amazon EC2 is the vendor's IAS offering. Amazon RDS, that's their DBPAS offering. We learned that we can run any software we want on IAS. If you visit some of the cloud developer discussion forums, you'll see a lot of chatter on Amazon versus Azure. It's almost like Ford versus Chevy. I did find a common theme that many developers feel that Amazon is more accommodating than Linux Unix deployments in Azure. In addition to non-Microsoft DBAs, MySQL and Postgres, for example, felt that Amazon was a better choice for their systems, stating that Microsoft's invitation was not as easy to work with as Amazon's. Amazon currently offers a broad and deep suite of cloud DBMS services. Customers could choose from fully managed products that include Relational, Aurora, DynamoDB, NoSQL, Data Warehouse, Redshift, and Memory, ElastiCache. Amazon's RDS product suite provides consumers with six managed database engines. That includes Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, MariaDB, MySQL, and PostgreSQL. On the other end of the management ownership spectrum, we talked about EC2. That provides customers with total administrative control over their entire software stack, which includes their database instances. This wide array of offerings allows shops to choose their cloud DBMS architecture of choice. From traditional IAS models that provide them with a high level of administrative control to DBPAS environments, the turnover ownership of the database and OS software to Amazon. When compared to Oracle and Microsoft, Amazon's fully managed product offerings are traditionally viewed to be less competitive in a head-to-head -head comparison of database features and functionality. When you compare DynamoDB example, Aurora, compared to its MySQL equivalents. But in order to perform a thorough comparison of the vendors, we can't constrain ourselves to analyzing just the database features alone. We must also examine the vendor's entire suite of offerings, as well as the cloud DBMS ecosystem. And that's an ecosystem that includes the range of architectures available, pricing models, provisioning, geographic data redundancy, compute and storage architectures, security controls, administrative tools, edge technologies, and products. Amazon, by the very nature of its business offering, is the most mature provider of cloud architectures. As a result, it has a significant head start on its two main rivals. If we turn towards Microsoft, we, we know that Linux, kind of interesting that I lead off with Linux when we discuss Microsoft, but we know that Linux is the cloud's most popular operating system. Amazon, Apache, Rackspace, Google Cloud, OpenStack, they're all based on Linux. Microsoft states that in, in its own Azure environment, one in three of those systems is driven by Linux. 
Microsoft is shifting from being a proprietary on-premises software company to a cloud-based services provider and knew that they need to embrace Linux as an operating system. There are a couple of driving factors behind Microsoft's decision to begin offering SQL Server on Linux. One was to allow SQL Server to compete more effectively against Oracle, which runs on both Windows and Linux Unix, and two, to allow SQL Server to be more widely adopted by the cloud. Microsoft's Azure offering, it consists of both IAS, where we know we can run any software we want, and DBPAS, where they rent you a database. Microsoft SQL Azure is its most popular DBPAS database, but Microsoft also offers SQL Data Warehouse, DocumentDB, Table Storage, and Redis as part of its DBPAS offering. Remember that we're comparing the suite of cloud offerings, not just individual database products. Amazon, we know, provides the greatest number of cloud DBMS alternatives. But when you compare their cloud provisioning, security, administration, and their compute and storage architecture, Microsoft Azure is rapidly closing the functionality gap with Amazon, even though Amazon had a seven-year head start. Some may argue that that functionality gap is already closed between the two vendors. Azure is and will continue to be the platform of choice for customers who are strongly committed to the Microsoft tech stack. Microsoft's strengths are its hybrid architecture, which we talked about earlier, its huge customer base, and SQL Server's robust feature set. A recent survey of 100 CIOs by Morgan Stanley predicted that Azure adoption rates will outpace Amazon by 2019. Let's differentiate between SQL Server Azure, which is Microsoft's database platform as a service offering, and Azure itself. That's its general database, here's your server cloud service offering. Although Microsoft does allow customers to run their database and OS of choice on Azure IAS, the perception is that Azure IAS on the DB, DBMS cloud forms is kind of spotty. The level of frustration depends on the DBMS product you're trying to run in Azure. It could be the traditional Ford versus Chevy open environment versus corporate industry standard, but the general views are that Amazon provides a more robust environment for a wider range of database products. Let's talk about Oracle. It's the newcomer. It's got a Late start. Oracle has a wide array of offerings already for both IAS and DBPAS. They're entering into this market very late in the game. As I said, Amazon has a 10-year head start. They're competing against Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, and the Google Cloud Platform for IAS. The Cloud Security Alliance estimates that those three vendors already hold an 82% share of the market. For its DBPAS offering, Oracle offers the Oracle database, MySQL, and Oracle's NoSQL product. We know that Oracle entered into the cloud war much later than Amazon, and a few years behind Microsoft, it has some catching up to do. The DB vendor, it's launched an all-out offensive to challenge both Amazon and Microsoft. Oracle hired Peter Magnuson from Google as its senior VP of cloud development and Don Johnson from Amazon as its VP of engineering. In addition, Ellison pretty much declared an all-out war against Amazon in his 2016 Open World keynote presentation. We need to remember this is the same vendor that went after DB2. DB2 was the leading relational vendor at that time by a significant margin. Oracle was just an upstart product that was in its infancy. Oracle quickly overcame DB2 as the leading relational vendor. Can they duplicate this? I don't think anyone can answer that right now. Do I think Oracle can become a significant challenger? Absolutely yes. Oracle is still defining its cloud strategies and architectures. As I stated earlier, it has catching up to do. 
The benefits of Oracle is that it has a very strong set of database monitoring tools for its cloud databases. In the databases, there is a more direct feature match between its on-premises and cloud offerings. And Oracle also has a strong hybrid cloud strategy. The vendor also allows customers to create their own virtual private networks on the cloud. How their offering is different is they moved the I.O. and network virtualization from the hypervisor layer to the network layer. Oracle calls it a bump in the wire. It sits outside of your physical box. That means you can easily plug in bare metal hosts, database servers, storage devices, VM servers, pretty much anything you want into that virtual private network. You equate that virtual private network to your on-premises network only in the cloud. You know, I'm not promoting this product, but I think it's important to talk about Oracle's bare metal cloud services because it differs from some of these other competing vendors. We know that Oracle offers traditional cloud services in which you share computing resources with others. Most cloud providers use heavily customized hypervisor software to provide their multi-tenant cloud service. Customers share resources with each other. Oracle also offers bare metal compute, storage, networking, governance, load balancing, and database cloud services. No hypervisor software is used. Customers deploying a solution on Oracle bare metal services are assigned a dedicated hardware server that has zero vendor software installed on it. The way they've designed their network and infrastructure layers, you can still take advantage of quick provisioning and elasticity, but you don't have to worry about noisy neighbors affecting your environment. You can install anywhere, any software you want on it, including your own hypervisor software. Amazon currently has an enormous lead over both Microsoft and Oracle in cloud customers and cloud revenue. In addition, since it is a head start on these competitors, it has built a very robust cloud service architecture. Amazon has the funds and expertise to constantly expand into new offerings and improve upon the existing ones. The challenge for Amazon is it has a limited ability to provide on-premises or hybrid cloud services to customers. It's going to be relegated to a cloud-only DBMS services provider until consumers begin to move into a wholesale adoption of cloud database management systems as their architecture of choice they will never be able to challenge Oracle or Microsoft's market leadership positions in DBMS revenue. Amazon is making every effort to accelerate this wholesale adoption of cloud systems. In Q4 of 2016, they released AWS Database Migration Services. It's a very robust replication utility that allows you to initially seed your Amazon cloud database with data and then keep it in sync with your on-premise systems. We know that right now neither Oracle or Microsoft can match Amazon in breadth and depth of product offerings. Oracle and Microsoft offerings will become the architecture of choice for customers who are committed to their product. They will also become attractive alternatives for those shops that prefer the freedom to seamlessly integrate their cloud and on-premises database implementations, these hybrid clouds. I think Microsoft's overall architecture is comparable in features and benefit to Amazon. Oracle has the foundations for a very strong hybrid strategy. Here's an example. They just announced an update to their ZFS storage appliance. It allows these on-premises storage systems to view the Oracle cloud as just another drive. It removes the need for an external cloud gateway and the associated licensing fees that the vendor charges. What they're doing is they're lacing on-premises and cloud systems together into a hybrid. All three of these vendors have very strong offerings. Each of them is stronger in some areas than their competitors. RDX has recommended all three of them to the customers, to our customers, for different reasons. We listened to what our customers were looking for in a cloud DB system, what was important to them, and then made our recommendation accordingly. We feel entirely comfortable with all of those recommendations. 
Most surveys state that the top two reasons that shops are concerned about moving to the cloud is security and loss of control over the environment. Most managers, they feel secure knowing that their shop is in total control of the environments that they're tasked with supporting. When you move to the cloud, you're going to share that control with another vendor. That loss of control is a big sticking point for many organizations. That's perfectly understandable. And it will have a direct bearing on the architecture and cloud provider you choose. Depending on that vendor, the architecture configuration and DB product chosen, you may find that you'll be tailoring your database configuration, your application, your tools, utilities, interfaces, maybe even the SQL statements, procedural language to work in that vendor's environment. We know that the more we tailor our tech stack configuration to any vendor, the more locked in we become. During your initial evaluation, you'll need to determine how much customization you'll need to do by performing the proper due diligence and also determining how important it is to your shop to have the freedom to swap vendors. RDX's recommendation is to thoroughly evaluate the competing architectures, not just the products. What level of change are you comfortable with? Do you rent the DB software? What does the vendor's compute and storage architecture look like? Most important, how will they charge you? Here are RDX's recommendations for those customers considering or implementing cloud-based DBMS solutions. Your strategy could be we want to test the waters. That's what we recommend. Try the cloud on a few selected apps, but you need to choose the right ones. Thoroughly understand the architectures and select the vendor offering the best meets your needs. Then realize that once you move your database up there, they'll be supported differently than their on-premises counterparts. This isn't an architecture that should be entered into with, without much analysis and forethought. If you'd like us to help you, we'd be glad to do so. We're here to help you when you're ready. If you take the time to perform the required due diligence and be willing to absorb the costs associated with that upfront analysis, you'll be able to select the appropriate architecture that meets your shop's needs. If you don't, you'll end up spending much more in ongoing support than you hope for. And this wraps up the cloud architecture overview. You know, I highly recommend next month's presentation. That could be on business intelligence. We'll discuss the benefits of BI, talk about BI in the cloud, provide participants with a demo of Microsoft's BI offering. It's going to be a great presentation for you to attend. You can also send me an email. See for the RDX if you want to uh, join our newsletter. Um, Kelly, do we have any questions for today's presentation? Yes, Chris, we did have a couple come in during the presentation, so I'll start with the first one. What is the greatest challenge when you evaluate DBP, AAS, IAAS, and the vendor offerings? That's a good question. I think the biggest challenge is the sheer number of features available and the variations between the different vendor offerings. I used to work in a high-tech think tank for a Fortune 100 company, and one of my responsibilities is to kind of evaluate various products and technologies. That's a pretty simple process when you compare it to evaluating cloud architectures. The criteria you collect and analyze and compare, you know, in those days it was somewhat manageable, manageable, but for these cloud systems, you're comparing architectures, not products. You can't constrain your evaluation to just DB features for DBPAS or a small set of comparative evaluation criteria for IAS. You have to look at the vendor's entire cloud ecosystem. You also have to determine what's important to you, you know, what's important to your shop when you evaluate those cloud systems. You, you need to use that traditional evaluation methodology. You compile a list of evaluation criteria. You weight them according to importance. For example, not being locked into a particular vendor, that may rank very high on your list. You'll spend more time on that part of the evaluation than you would on other areas that aren't as important to you. Anything else? Yes. 
Another one reads, in the past when we looked at Amazon or other vendors, it was very expensive because we have PHI data in our database. How do vendors handle databases with PHI data? Now that's, a, uh, that's a constant challenge um, with data that's sensitive, you know, healthcare, um, and those costs are somewhat uh, prohibitive. You know, but certainly all three of those vendors understand that. And as I said, you know, one of my responsibilities here at RDX is to continue to evaluate those vendors and, you know, and looking and discussing some of these uh, issues, you know, with uh, uh, people on discussion forums that, you know, we are seeing them move into uh, attempting to lower those costs, but they're still not there yet. You know, this whole architecture, I know it's been around a long time, but truthfully, you know, for mainstream implementation, it's still kind of in its infancy. You know, we need to take this kind of wait and see on where they're going to go and how much they're going to reduce these charges. And I fully understand that, especially with sensitive data, those costs could be prohibitive. I just don't have a solution for it, and I don't think the vendors do either right now. You know, there is some data that it's best to remain on site and maybe the next cloud implementation up, which is IAS, which allows you to do a better job of protecting that environment on your own. You know, we, uh, you know, RDX, we support customers that have IAS and they have sensitive data stored in it. Next question. How quickly will the cloud surpass on-premises for implementation? I think the cloud implementations are going to continue to accelerate. But we all know that we need to take vendor and industry pundit forecasts with a grain of salt. Shops have a lot of money invested in their on-premises architectures. There's also a lot of apps that share data with each other, or like we just discussed, they have sensitive data. We learned in this presentation that passing data back and forth, you know, that can be an issue. Securing regulation, those are other factors. On premise of the cloud, it's going to coexist for many years to come. And that's why I'm a big fan of the big relational vendors, their attempts to create these seamless hybrid architectures that allow you to very easily choose Right, where you're going to deploy that database? So, do I deploy it uh, on premises? Do I deploy it on an IAS architecture, or do I move it into a cloud provider-supported DBPAS architecture? You know, the ultimate goal is for developers and DBAs to be able to seamlessly interact with both cloud and on-premises, because we are not going to have a total cloud environment. And we're not going to have total on-premises anymore. That hybrid cloud, it, I feel, is going to be the architecture of choice. Anything else? Yes, we have one more. Larry okay. Ellison stated that. I'm sorry, Chris. I just laughed. Okay. This one reads, Larry Ellison stated that Oracle's mission will be to overtake Amazon. What's the chance of that happening? You know, I think of the, the three vendors, Oracle's building a very strong technical foundation. It's quickly implementing technologies that, in, in my opinion, are, they're extremely competitive. And they are comparable or even more advanced in some cases than Microsoft or Amazon, especially their hybrid strategy, which com combines its cloud and on-premises. We know that Oracle's hired some pretty strong talent away from its competitors. Talked about Magnuson from Google and Johnson from Amazon. You know, Johnson spent spent eight years at Amazon building on AWS. I would think that he knows what works and what doesn't, and they're building Oracle's environment from scratch. But I think Oracle has at least a couple of years of development ahead of them to be able to compete on features with Amazon and Microsoft. The challenge for Oracle is Amazon's huge customer base. They have large revenue numbers. Amazon has a 10-year head start on them. Microsoft has a three-year lead. 
Amazon and, and Microsoft, they're not going to wait for any vendor to catch them. They'll continue to improve upon their existing infrastructure, and they're going to aggressively pursue new technologies. I think currently Microsoft has a better chance of making a run at Amazon, but Amazon is going to be the market leader for years to come. You know, one of the problems with evaluating the revenue numbers for any vendors, you, know, you, you don't really know if you can trust any of them. If you look on the web, you'll find dozens of news reports where you know, all these vendors fancy footwork with their, their cloud estimates. But you know, as I said, Amazon is going to be the continued leader for some time to come. I think Oracle will become a strong challenger. It will be one Amazon, two Oracle, I'm sorry, two Microsoft, and three uh, will be um, Oracle. So um, I think Oracle just started very late. Uh, I think that you know, they put a good team together and they have the right technologies. They just, have, they just need time. It will be a, a much more balanced playing field in a few years. Um, right now it's not. So I think that uh, was the end um, of the questions. You know, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's presentation. And like I said, if you want to um, become a contact on LinkedIn, just send me a request. Um, Chris Foote and I work at RDX, Remote DB Experts. Uh, we'll be sending a copy um, of this presentation to all participants. And if you'd like to sign up for next month's presentation on BI, you can also do that. So once again, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate uh, your time today. And uh, have a great weekend. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everyone.